Today I'm going to do a video on how foods you eat can lead to production of specific antibodies that might not serve you well. And specifically, this, uh, these are IgG4 antibodies. This was one of the top five topics that was previously selected by, by an audience of interest to cover. And one of the reasons why is because these IgG4 antibodies, they're somewhat mysterious. But what we do know is that almost everyone who, have, who has taken mRNA vaccines would have been producing these IgG4 antibodies against the spike protein. So it's to induce tolerance, basically, so that your immune system can handle what is being thrown at it at copious amount without causing too big of a problem. But what the authors in these publications I'm going to be covering today talk about is that it's still an issue because these IgG4 antibodies that you produce to food they can also lead to inflammation. They are associated with increased inflammation in general as well. And this is basically why the authors of uh, the two studies that I will be discussing wanted to determine whether reducing foods that might be producing IgG4 antibodies could be helping individuals in terms of healing from certain conditions. And specifically, the conditions that they were looking at is either chronic pain or alert um, or having allergic uh, allergies in uh, children so let's talk about the first paper and this is the paper that uh, looked about igg4 antibodies in people who have chronic pain so by the way igg4 antibodies have been discovered related to food that's yeah, that has already been discovered in 1970s but really it's heavily understudied this is one of the reasons why igg4 antibodies are so mysterious they're just not very well understood they're not very well studied right now we have a bit of a more of a field day in a scientific world related to igg4 antibodies precisely because as we know there was such a um, large response to vaccines uh, mm. resulting in production of these IgG4 antibodies in mRNA vaccinated individuals so that provided more opportunity to study these antibodies and in greater detail and basically understand what 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 they mean nevertheless in this particular paper it only came out in 2022 and this relation between food and these IgG4 antibodies and how they might be contributing to your health problems, it's extremely new. So again, this is one of, the, this is a, authors claim that what they did is the first of its kind study. This is only in 2022, so we're really just discovering this knowledge. But this still might be of interest to people who were either mRNA vaccinated, people who might uh, be dealing with cancer, because remember I also did a series of videos talking about how IgG4 antibodies play, might play a role in cancer as well. And then, of course, people that uh, either have uh, allergies or, or chronic pain, because this is what we're talking about in, in this video. So in the first paper, what they did is they, they looked at 54 individuals who had chronic pain, and they divided the, these people into four groups based on what kind of chronic pain they had. So And basically, they made up anywhere between 20 to 30 percent of the total and basically these included people who had neuropathic chronic pain so basically pain related to improper function of the nerves so the nerves are misfiring the other group was um, was people who had lower back pain cr chronic pain people who had a headache chronic pain and people who had also uh, diffuse chronic pain basically people who not, the chronic pain is not necessarily identified the source is not necessarily identified but they have pain all over their body so and by chronic what they define is that by chronic would how it was defined is that these people had to be experiencing pain for at least one year so this is pretty serious and what they did is they tested these individuals for 80 different type of foods uh, for antibodies and specifically we're talking about igg4 antibodies they divided those foods into 10 categories so let's see if i'm gonna remember it. Uh, so that was uh, fish, meat, eggs, dairy products, legumes, vegetables, fruits, dry fruits or nuts. They labeled as dry fruits, but really they meant nuts, cereals, and then others. Everything else was ver various other foods was in the last group. And they looked at basically two things. Number one was what were people responding to the most 
to the most in terms of producing IgG for antibodies. And second is which foods resulted in production of greatest amount of antibodies. So for example, in terms of what people were responding to the most, green beans was there, that, that was uh, um, there, and millet, wheat, um, eggs, and, and say sh sheep milk. Those were the foods that people in the small group were responding to the most, but not necessarily had to mean that the production of IgG for antibodies to these foods were was large. So then what they also did is look at the amounts of uh, antibodies that people were producing as a response to to uh, what they were e uh, eating before, obviously, and and that was very different. So there there they there was few categories. Number one, what people produced most anti IgG for antibodies to was number one cereals with uh, sp with um, spillet was number one took the number one spot. Wheat was number five. The second largest group was eggs, specifically especially. The egg white that took the number two spot of the of an of IgG4 antibodies production, and we're talking about very large numbers, like very very bad. And then the next one was um, dairy products, so we're talking about cow's milk as well as casein. And the last one was the their label of dry fruits or basically nuts. And number fifth spot was was taken by hazelnuts, and then almonds was were also in that group. So that's what people responded to the most, and they provided this chart. You can see what people responded to to most frequently. This is this is interesting because technically, technically, this provides us some information on what people basically produce these unwanted IgG4 antibodies to what kind of foods most frequently in terms of the greatest amount. Now, <clears throat> in terms of the four groups of people with chronic pain, the people who produce most IgG4 antibodies were people with neuropathic chronic pain as well as lower back pain. But it's the next part that is, of course, of greatest interest to us is because in the next part is they ask these people to basically remove the foods from their diet for 30 days to which they were responding. And by the way, almost 90% of everyone responded to at least one food with medium to high levels of IgG4. Everyone responded to something, but it not necessarily had to be high amount of foods, okay? So, but about 90% of people responded to, with higher amounts to, to some foods, to at least one food. And two thirds of these people had to remove at least five foods based on their antibody responses, okay? And uh, they removed the foods for 30 days. And uh, what the authors of the paper noticed is that after 30 days, their chronic pain significantly improved. There was, there was a marked impro improvement in, in their pain. So this is super interesting because, because authors talk about, look, these IgG4 antibodies, this might be a novel way of helping people. These IgG4 antibodies um, that are produced to food, maybe they're not necessarily causing the symptom directly, but they could be contributing to inflammation, which m might be no big deal in a healthy person, but a person who's suffering from pain, it might be um, helping produce the, the pain in the end. So that, that were, to them, this was really interesting, and they suggested, like, look, medically, perhaps we should be investigating this uh, to a greater extent, and they provide a really great s summary uh, graphic of, of, of this uh, as well. Remember, this is still very new. This is literally, according to them, this was the very first time, and this is only in 2022, that this type of medical experiment has ever been done where food was removed from diet for people with pain because because of the type of IgG4 antibodies that they were producing to, to, to food. So super, super interesting. However, when it comes to the antibody levels, they, 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 there wasn't really a drop in, I, in those IgG4 antibody levels after those 30 days of changed diet. And the authors mentioned that could be because of the fact that 30 days is simply not enough to see a difference. And that actually might be true because of the Second paper I want to tell you now about another study. This is now a bigger study and a longer duration study, which might seem to 
corroborate what the authors of the first paper mentioned. And this second study was now in children with, uh, with allergies. And the uh, authors of that paper mentioned is, look, allergies are, are very common in children and they are increasing in prevalence over time. So they're, they're more and more frequent for whatever reason. They didn't dwell as to why this might be happening, that, that we're, we're seeing this now more frequently. And they looked at 400, over 400 children with a variety of different, uh, different um, allergic conditions. And again, this, they did the same thing. They studied these children for IgG4 antibodies against a variety of different foods. And once again, very similar to what was observed with adults in the previous paper, the most common responses to foods in these children were eggs and cereals or wheat. Or, uh, sorry, no, I'm wrong, uh, big, uh, milk, cow milk. So <clears throat> those are probably your two big ones that if you had to guess which foods might be causing an issue, those probably would be the two most common ones that one could uh, consider removing from their diet if, uh, if, if dealing with issues such as either pain, chronic pain, or maybe allergies. So in this case, the children were asked to remove foods that they were responding to with, with IgG4 antibodies for now three months, so m m three months or more, so much longer than the prior study. And once again, what, and there was two groups of children, so those who did the diet as well as those who did the diet with the IgG4 antibody um, response plus probiotics. So they wanted to see whether probiotics could help. And after the, the kids were tested after several months again, then once again, there was a significant improvement in clinical symptoms for these children. So this is a big deal. But unlike the previous studies, there was indeed a drop in these IgG4 antibodies that these kids were producing to the foods they were eating. Although the drop was bigger, seen bigger in the group of kids that did not take probiotics. So it seems like if you took probiotic food, perhaps it did not help you reduce the production of IgG4, antib uh, IgG4 antibodies to these foods, but the kids who did um, take probiotics, they did see greater clinical improvement. So maybe the probiotics did not help against IgG4 antibodies as much, but it had potentially other benefits as well that it helped with clinical symptoms. And we're talking about approximately almost 70% um, response rate in the kids that didn't do probiotics, just diet restriction, versus almost 80% in the kids that did the diet restriction plus probiotics. So very, very cool. And, uh, and the authors flat out mentioned, listen, uh, this is something that we should be considering and uh, it, it corroborates the, the theory that diet restrictions could be very, valuable tool, medical tool for people with certain conditions. So in this regard, <clears throat> who could benefit the most from this? And well, we're talking about obviously people with chronic pain could consider looking at this type of information. Uh, people with cancers, as I already mentioned at the beginning of this video, that people with cancers, IgG4 antibodies might not be your friend. And when it comes to cancers, it doesn't matter what these IgG4 antibodies are targeting. This is why response to the spike protein in mRNA vaccinated individuals might not be good news if an individual also happens to have cancer. That doesn't mean it's going to make things worse, etc. But we do know that IgG4 antibodies might contribute to increasing problems, basically, you could say like that. So those are the people who potentially then might consider diet restrictions based on what kind of food they're responding to in terms of production of IgG4 antibodies. But uh, also another one is perhaps mRNA vaccinated individuals as well, because if you're already producing IgG4 antibodies, elevated IgG4 antibodies in your system because of the spike protein, and, and uh, then perhaps you might not want to be adding to that problem by responding to certain foods. So that's something that could potentially be considered uh, 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 as well. 
which is probably the reason why why this was a topic of interest. Now, personally, I, I thought when I when I wanted to study this material, I was wondering whether this is a diet that could help reduce IgG4 antibodies of all kinds. But obviously, we're just talking about IgG4 antibodies against specific foods. So that's it that's that's what i wanted to tell you in the in today's video that uh, i thought that was, that was very interesting <laughs> and um i'm always slightly influenced by what i study as well and and uh, i generally already don't have many milk products in my diet for example i generally don't have much bread in my diet uh, already but obviously in me and or eggs for that matter it's those are foods that i have actually naturally previously restricted out of my diet for a variety of different reasons without even knowing this IgG4 um, connection as well. But, but it made me really think, it's like, ah, interesting, because in my head, diet is one of the greatest elements that can influence our health. To me, perhaps exercises, number one, I, I struggle with this all the time as to what ranks the top, whether it's exercise or food, but I, I'm leaning towards exercise, but the number two probably diet. You can let me know what you think yourself, but uh, clearly very, very important and interesting information and very new information. This is brand new, just coming out, and hopefully we'll have more such studies in the near future. All right, that's it for now. And uh, once again, thank you for supporting, uh, supporting the channel. This is really important, especially in these times of uh, struggles, <laughs> uh, if you know what I mean, in terms of uh, me getting previously in trouble in trouble for uh, certain videos and uh, i look forward to seeing you in another video installment bye everyone